Hey everyone, my name is Chelsea. Welcome to Little Mountain Ranch. Welcome to my kitchen. I am very happy to have you here with me today and I am very excited for today's video. I wanna share with you something that Dan bought for me that absolutely thrills me to no end. I do like to live my life in a little bit of a, I don't know, an old fashioned sort of way. And one of the things that I've found when I have been shopping for cookbooks over the years is that most of the cook cookbooks or the ingredients in them are either hard to come by in our area, are expensive, and they're not really very simple. For the most part, they're kind of complicated. Um, the way that I cook, which you've probably noticed over the last couple of years, is pretty simple and kind of old fashioned. My sister says that the cookbooks that I'm working on right now are very kind of an old timey flavor of cooking and that is the way that I cook. And being a homesteader where I'm producing a lot of my own food off my own property, I use pretty simple ingredients for the most part. Dan had this idea that maybe old cookbooks, cookbooks that were written in say the late 1800s, early 1900s, because people that lived during those times had very similar uh, lifestyles to us, at least in the way that they produced food or produced a lot of their own food. Most families back then had a large garden or access to markets where they could access fresh homegrown kind of food. So Dan bought me five absolutely amazing cookbooks. So the quality of the cookbook itself, as far as how good of condition it's in, doesn't matter to me one bit. In fact, the more worn that it is, like this one, the more notes that are written on the inside, the better in my opinion. So I wanna run you through a couple of these um, cookbooks because they're just, they're so fantastic. Dan got me this book at Griner's Drugstore in Munsville in the summer of 1917. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? My favorite part of this particular cookbook is the suggestions to young housekeepers on economy and the use of leftovers. So I'm just gonna read a little bit of this to you because it's, it's pure gold. It's called Marketing Economically. And when it's talking about marketing in this context, it's talking about going to the market. It says, in order to buy economically, one must go to the market in person and see what she buys. Do not give orders by telephone or through the boy sent from the market, and do not go to the market with the intention of buying just a set of articles and no other. Take advantage of the supplies offered. An oversupply of a certain article may have a lowered price for the time being, and this is your opportunity. Do not buy, however, unless the product be of good quality and be of such character as will be acceptable to your family. Learn to market by marketing. There is no sure way to distinguish the various cuts of meat, but by seeing them cut from the side of beef or lamb and then handling them yourself. Soon you will be able to know the external appearance about whether you are buying bone, fat, or lean meat, or whether the cheap cut which you plan to buy is of good quality as it should be. I love this so much. In buying vegetables, remember that size is not always a favorable recommendation. You get the most for your money when all the edible portions of what you buy are eaten. Tenderness and accompaniment of youth is what you are looking for in vegetables. I love that, the accompaniment of youth. How perfect is that? Fresh vegetables is well nigh a necessity. It is more ep economical to buy in small quantities than to run the risk of its decay at your hands. Bananas, if rather green, may be bought more generously, but they should be attached to the parent stock and removed from the paper bag enclosing them as soon as they are uh, received in the house. So the other sections are spending time rather than money and the use of leftovers. And the way it's written is absolutely beautiful, but the information itself is, is actually pretty good. I love it. I just love it so much. So that's one. <laughs> this one just absolutely cracks me up. So this is called The Art of Cooking and Serving. Inside of this cookbook, there are handwritten recipes. There is actually a letter. This is interesting. It looks like it's written in Persian or Arabic. Um, there's handwritten letters in here from this woman's mother. And then she also has newspaper clippings from recipes from all these different newspapers. There's a really cool newspaper clipping that I wanted to show you out of that. And then I wanted to read you a little section out of that too, because it's just, it's just priceless. And then one of the other little treasures that we found in this one, this is canning, preserving and pickling, 1914. 
And as I was flipping through this, I came across to dry herbs and mushrooms. And there was a four leaf clover pressed in the pages. Isn't that fabulous? I'm gonna keep that right there. I just wanted to read to you a section from The Art of Cooking and Serving. So this, this cookbook is just absolutely thrills me. Look at a color photo in it. So fabulous. And throughout the whole cookbook, there's her handwritten notes in it. Homemakers, it would appear, are in need of a brief, authentic reference book on modern cooking and serving. Though our standards of living are higher today than they ever were, they are simpler, for common sense and new knowledge about health have shaped them. The lavish formal table, table customs of 20 or even 10 years ago now seem pretentious and out of date. With these facts in mind, this book has been written. Besides the latest information on nutrition and table service, it contains more than 500 recipes, all of which were carefully tested before they were permitted in play, a place here in this book. The majority of them call for Crisco, but there are recipes for foods too in which no shortening is used. Because it is desired that this book shall be well-rounded out cooking guide of the greatest possible value to the average homemaker, that she may find in it the help and inspiration she needs for her complex task of homemaking is our earnest wish. The way these sections are divided thrills me. <laughs> so the first one is table service in the servantless home. Oh, and there's some little cut out recipes in here as well. So, and then this is all divided up into afternoon tea, dinner, Sunday night supper and all of that. And then table service in a house with a servant. And within the section of the table service in a house with a servant, there is a photo that shows the appropriate wear for your servant morning and evening. <laughs> oh my goodness, it's just priceless. This is priceless. So the language in which this was written just brings me so much joy. So let's go to this first little section here. I think what I might do is take some pictures of some of these pages and share them over on my website so that you can actually see them and read through them yourself if you're interested, but I will read a couple of things because this is just so fantastic. Three things that a meal must be when you are your own cook and waitress. It must be nourishing, it must be reasonably easy to prepare, and it must give your family pleasure in the way in which it was served. Since well-bred people avoid display, especially display that is out of keeping with their means, the mistress of the servantless house does not attempt the formalities of table service observed by the richest family in town. <laughs> the old proverb that advises us to bite off only as much as we can chew applies very aptly to serving. It is a sign of good taste to do only as much as we can do well and to leave the extreme expressions of style to those who have the money and the servants to carry them out. <laughs> This is so, oh my goodness, Dan, are you listening to this? This is so wonderful. The intelligent woman fits her service into her pocketbook and her strengths. Certain fundamental rules she observes with the latter, of course, but beyond that, she has given wide latitude to work with her own tastes and her own conveniences. She must choose, for instance, or she may choose, for instance, to bring broiled chops to the table in a covered earthenware casserole instead, on a platter instead of on a platter which matches her dinner set. But what sane person would find fault with this method when it is the only way of keeping the food piping hot from the long journey from her particular kitchen? This matter of serving hot foods hot and cold food cold happens to be one of the most fundamental rules which no woman who aspires to be a good housekeeper can make light of. It just has to be done. However, it is accomplished <laughs> and it just goes on and on. So I could go through these all day with you because they absolutely bring me so much joy, but I will not and I will get to actually cooking. So what we're going to do is we are going to cook recipes over the next number of weeks out of all of these cookbooks. So we're going to take cooking these recipes up a notch and we're going to cook them on our wood cook stove so it's more authentic to the type of cooking um, appliances that they would have had back then. And I'm so excited about this. Um, one of the things that we're going to be making today is cornbread and we're using a corn stick pan to make them. This is not something that I have ever used before and I'm really excited to try it. So Dan is actually gonna help me with all of the recipes that we're doing today. Um, out of the cookbook, we're going to use, oh, I didn't even show you this cookbook. This is the new Pen Pennsylvania Dutch 
cookbook. This one's not that old. This one was, I think, 1956, but it was the only recipe book that had a cornbread recipe in it. Uh, this one's 1958. So we are going to do the cornbread out of this cookbook. So there is the recipe and I will share that down in the show notes below for you as well. So I think the soup that we're going to do today for the cornbread is going to be a corn and potato chowder. And this is actually a freezer meal that I have in the freezer. And I'll talk through a little bit about how we um, did this because I didn't freeze it with the cream or with the broth. I'm just gonna run up to the freezer and grab the soup. Just give me one sec. So all we did was we chopped up our potatoes and cooked them up with the corn, added all of our seasonings like our onions and our thyme and all of that and then cooled it off and froze it. And once we thaw this, we will mix in cream and soup stock to make that soup. I think that's gonna be just delicious. Okay, Dan, are you ready? Dan is just doing some research over there on some of those newspaper clippings, so he'll come share what he's found in a couple of minutes. And in the meantime, I think what we're gonna do, I think we'll do the soup and the cornbread for dinner tonight. And for lunch, we are going to do some bread pudding. We'll get this all mixed up. This is a pretty easy recipe. It comes together really fast. This isn't one of the ones out of this um, cookbook. It's actually one of the ones out of mine. Um, sandwich. Award-winning sandwiches. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but on the back. I'm gonna check that, I'm move this there. In the sports column, which it's missing most of the article, unfortunately, but it has this thing that's happening says, another report says third baseman Joe Strip has been approached with the idea of making him player manager. Well, the name of Babe Ruth is mentioned frequently. Ruth is likely to become the number one candidate if a deal for the sale of the club to the syndicate, headed by Colonel T.L. Houston, former part owner of the Yankees, goes through. Okay. So you can look up in history and see that it's old. Yeah. And sold his interest in the Yankees to Rupert in 1923. So this is probably 1922. And it's Babe Ruth. That is so... <laughs> when he was still playing for the Yankees, that's when this was all cut out. Oh, man. That <laughs> In is 1922. That's 100 years old. Wow. And look at what excellent condition it is. So cool. Okay, we have to make every single one of these recipes. This should actually go in like a... We should frame, frame it or something. Or something. It's... <laughs> all the phone numbers are four digits, and this is... Um, so this is like when operators were managing the calls and putting them through, right? Yeah. Like the <sighs> telephone number is 7821. That is or so Or 2361. Cool. Sue chef ready. Okay. <laughs> prepared, you need your tools like you did earlier today. <laughs> I need my tool belt. He stuck, his tool, <laughs> he stuck his cooking tools in there. Definitely need those. Okay. Um, so let's start with the bread pudding, which I actually have as a recipe on my phone. So I have 24 cups of chopped bread here. Okay, you need to grab three cups of raisins. Oh, okay. bless you. Just tell me what to do. Okay, three cups of raisins from down there, and we'll throw that into here. Okay, so we are going to make two large pans of bread pudding. We are going to do, I am going to put this cookbook just out of the way so that I don't wreck it with our cornbread recipe. Okay, so we need to grease these pans very well with butter. So into this, we are going to add a dozen eggs. So this is obviously a huge batch, so you can have this. Uh, we need 10 cups of milk. So what I'm doing here is making a basic custard, which is basically just milk, sugar, eggs, little vanilla. Bring me anywhere. And I actually need four teaspoons of vanilla, which means I might need to go down and grab another bottle. So half a teaspoon of salt, 
two teaspoons of cinnamon. No, we'll just whisk them in with the custard here. Yeah, can I have your whisk there? Oh, absolutely. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so what we're gonna do here is we're not actually going to make a finished custard. This is just going to be the custard that will go in and it will turn custard custardy once it's baked in the oven. Okay, whoa. Okay, so we're gonna whisk this up. And the recipe actually calls for allowing this to sit overnight in the fridge so that all the flavors can meld. But we are not going to do that today. We're just going to let it sit for around 20 minutes, just enough for everything to get soaked in to the bread and then we'll bake it in the oven. Okay, so do you wanna put, you can mix the raisins in with that bread and then you can just put the bread in the pans. Yeah, the bread, it's right there. Yeah, all the bread, bread cubes. So now we're going to pour half of the custard over one, half over the other. Okay, so we're just gonna push this in underneath this and then set this aside for, I don't know, around 20 minutes or so. Yeah, it is basically like a French toast, hey? Go for it. Okay, so while you're doing that, I will get started on the cornbread recipe. Okay, so we need a half a teaspoon of baking soda. That's baking powder. Would you mind grabbing the baking soda? I'm down there. Thank you. Oh, okay, so Dan. this. Yeah, look at you go. Well, this calls. Let me take over. I got this. <laughs> You got, okay, you ready? Yeah. Are you gonna go? <laughs> You're gonna do it? <laughs> okay, so we need two scant teaspoons of baking po powder. And scant just means just barely, not all the way up to the top. So we're gonna do, so instead of my usual heaping that I always put in everything, we'll do some two scant ones a tablespoon of sugar, a scant teaspoon of salt. That was the word of the day yesterday, right? Okay, so we need two thirds a cup of of corn meal. Did you get the baking soda? Do you wanna put a, um, we need a half a teaspoon of baking soda. I'm trying to follow this recipe exactly as it is written in this cookbook. Three eggs, yes. Mm -hmm. that, that looks like half. You can do three more eggs for this one. It's a good thing we have lots and lots of eggs right now. Okay, so we need a cup of sour milk. So what I do to sour my milk is I do one cup, you can use buttermilk too, and the sour milk that I'm gonna show you is a substitution for buttermilk, which you can use in any recipe. So we have our cup of milk, and then we are going to add in a teaspoon of vinegar. And the acidified milk, which is basically what you're doing by souring it this way, reacts with the baking soda, and then that helps to give you a fluffier bread. Okay, Martha needs a load here, so we want her nice and hot for this cornbread. Yep, yeah, add in the eggs and the milk and then you can just whisk that up. There, that looks perfect. So now comes the fun part of trying those corn stick pan or the corn stick pan. Okay, let's bring it over. Let's do it. Okay, put these in along the side of the stove here because I know it's the hot side. Okay, we're gonna do a little bit of a tidy on this and then get our soup going on the stove so that everything is ready 
at <laughs> once. And if this recipe that we are using out of this cookbook doesn't work for the corn sticks, Dan was saying when he was looking this up earlier that there were actual recipes that are called corn stick cornbread recipes that are designed specifically for that type of uh, baking pan. But I think this one will work. I think it'll be fine. I just don't know if my cook stove is going to get hot enough because it should be around 400 for cooking with those pans. I'm just gonna take our frozen soup and put it over here on Martha. And this side of the stove over here where the firebox is is the hottest. And since this is frozen, I'm going to put it up over here so that it has a chance to thaw. And then I'm going to add probably three quarts of chicken stock to this and a quart of cream. So we'll let, I'll put a lid on that too so it heats up a little bit faster. Dan's just doing some more research on these cookbooks, but he's not mic'd up. So just one second, I'm gonna grab the cookbook and share with you what he was just saying. So this book is, this is the one that was um, published in 1916 and given to the woman whose writing is in here in the summer of 1917. So the United States entered the war, the First World War in April of 1917, which would have been just a few months before she received this cookbook. The connections to history is just so amazing. Okay. So we definitely could fill these up a little bit more, but they have brown. So let's go see if we can get them out. I'm skeptical about being able to get these out of here. So the question is, should I just try to flip them or should I try to take them out? I feel like maybe I should try it. I'll try one with a fork first. You guys have to let me know if you have ever had these before or ever used one of these pans. Apparently they're, they were very popular in the South which is not, I don't think, oil, yeah. Don't think oh no, they're okay, but they definitely could be crispier. Yeah, I don't think I used enough oil. So more oil next time. Not the best. First batch, <laughs> First batch was not a success. Not yeah, exactly. I bet you they do taste good, yeah. Okay, way more oil. We are not going to be discouraged. We are going to give it another try. I'm gonna treat this the same way that I treat all my cast iron. I don't use soap on my cast iron, although I know many people that do. I just don't. And I usually, if things are stuck on like this, I might set it in the water for no more than five minutes and then it usually just peels right off. A lot more, yeah. Actually, why don't you put the oil in them? Cause I'm just gonna heat it up on the top of the cook stove over there. I'm just gonna add another tablespoon or so of sugar. And it does say that in the recipe, but if you want it to be a little bit sweeter, add a little bit more sugar. We could use, we could do lard. Like that's really old school. That's kind of the way they, what they would have used. Yep, I have lard. That's what they would have used originally. Yeah, I think the whole idea is because you're going for the crispy nest, you're almost like deep frying them. So I'm gonna say like half a teaspoon in each one. I don't need. We're definitely throwing heat now. A uh, little bit more, yeah. Ooh, okay, this is definitely hot. Oh my gosh. Look at all, yeah. Okay, ooh, that's gonna burn my hand. Okay. Okay, that looks right, nice and sizzly. I think we're gonna have it going on now. Got lots and lots of sizzling action going on. Okay, that looks better. Quite a bit darker. And they look like they pulled away from the side a little bit. Let's go get them out of here. Okay. Here we go. I feel like this one looks the most promising. Look at that, it worked. That was the key. That's the way it's supposed to work. Look at that, that's what they're supposed to look like. Yep, there we go, we got it. Look at them. Okay, so lard and lots of it, like a half a teaspoon or I guess a quarter teaspoon. Nope. Was that half that I used? 
Mm. I don't know. Yeah, around half a teaspoon of lard. Sticks. Little corn sticks. Look at that. That is so cool. Okay, let's go again with the last batch. For the ladies of old. Oh, yes. I always have respect for them. I know how much work it was to live that kind of lifestyle. I did that's, do that's it true. once. Yeah, we did once. Yeah, Dan and I actually um, lived in a house, an off-grid house with hand pump water for a year. It was an amazing experience. I absolutely loved it. I really wish we could have afforded to buy that place. It was so cool. Okay. Whew, my goodness. Okay, so I just wanted to show you this because this is kind of funny. This is leftovers from when Dan and I went out for dinner last night. It was our anniversary. And this is what I'm going to eat for lunch, even though I have all this gorgeous homemade, home-cooked food everywhere. So the trick to cast iron with wood cook stoves is a lot of heat and a lot of fat. Okay, we're gonna put our bread pudding into the oven and it needs to cook for about 45 minutes. And I'll show you what that looks like when it's all done. What it said in the ad was Old South Arkansas Family Estate was where we got the, um, the corn stick pan from. Sadly, we don't have a family name associated with it, which is too bad because I really love like the family history part of antiques. But it is still very cool. Pardon me? It's a number 273 Griswold corn stick pan. So it was made in Erie, Pennsylvania. That's where all the Griswold uh, cast iron products were made. We have a little bit of a change of plans when it comes to lunch. We're gonna switch things up and have the soup and the corn sticks for lunch. I added two quarts of um, chicken stock to this and then just under a quart of cream. Okay, so this is what our soup looks like and it smells really good. I'm just gonna give it a little taste to make sure I don't need to add any salt to it. Um, I think I'm just gonna leave salt and pepper adding to each, <clears throat> excuse me, each individual person because it tastes pretty good to me. Potato chowder is so yummy, isn't it? There we go. And then we'll get some corn sticks for you guys. Okay, you guys can grab spoons. So we are just going to stop and take a lunch break, but we'll be back with you again shortly. There is the bread pudding and it smells absolutely delicious. Um, one of the things you can note though, is that on this side, it's a little bit too dark. And that was because that was the side that was facing the hot side of the oven. And one of the tricks with cooking on a wood cook stove is to make sure to constantly be turning your pan inside the stove because one side is obviously a little bit hotter than the other, but I think it cooked that up quite well. So Dan and I have been going through these recipes again because we're a little bit obsessed. <laughs> They're so awesome. So this one, I think I showed this earlier. I think that this is Arabic. So I've taken a picture of it and I'm gonna put it up on the screen. And if any of you read Arabic or recognize what language this is and are able to translate it, if you could let us know in the comment section, that would be absolutely amazing. So on the back of this is a recipe written and it is actually a Czech. Can you see that? From the Ithaca Trust Company in, from Ithaca, New York. And then on the side it says 192. So you can put in the year for the 1920s. Oh, it's just the coolest thing ever. And this is another one that I absolutely love. So this one is called Bunny Beef in various ways. And it says, I'm gonna need my glasses. Hold on one second. So bunny beef in various ways. There is not a boy, but likes the fun of hunting rabbits when the snow is on the ground. Sometimes the country boys bring them in by the dozen great big fat ones. 
A few years ago, housewives seldom cooked rabbit meat. They were fed to the hens, the dogs, or left in the fields where the boys killed them. However, the high prices of meat products and the shortage brought on by the war has increased or has induced cooks to study different ways of preparing rabbit meat, so that now bunny beef comes to many tables quite often through the cold months when rabbits are fat and at their best for table use. And then it goes on, um, tells like about what to do with skinning and after skinning, emptying and washing, all of that. Um, fried rabbit, steamed rabbit, rabbit pie, stuffed rabbit, rabbit croquettes, rabbit sausage, and canned fried rabbit and canned stewed rabbit. This one is from December 27th, 1919. <laughs> That's incredible. Oh my gosh. Southern waffles. And this was typewritten on an old typewriter. Yeah, we should try this when we have waffles. Yeah. Let's try that. Okay, we'll do that. The next time that we make waffles, we'll make the Southern waffles. From And one of the other things that we learned from that cookbook is that there are notes in there from the woman who um, was the cookbook was given to, so back in 1917. But there's actually handwritten and dated recipes from 19, did you say 35 or 39? Um, by the same woman, it's because the, hand, the handwriting is the same. So she had this cookbook and used this cookbook for a very long time and then it was probably passed down to her children and so on until somehow it ended up in my kitchen. This one was, what year was this one in? I think this was 1914, a canning book from 1914. Oh my gosh. Obviously, the recipes in this cookbook probably aren't considered safe by modern standards, but I've been canning long enough that I'll be able to work through some of the recipes in this cookbook and make sure that I do them safely. But this is just so cool. Sweet potato butter, sun-preserved cherries, strawberry jelly, mulberry jelly, marmalade, muskmelon preserves. Oh my goodness, these books are such treasures. Okay, so we are going to make this recipe. This is applesauce cake. And I just want to see if I can figure out the woman's name because I do believe that there was a letter in here that was signed mother. So I'm going to guess that whoever it was addressed to was the woman whose cookbook this was. Oh, here we go. Her name's Betty, Dan. Nine, okay, so it says, Dear Betty, Tuesday evening, November 11th, 1930. Later in the day today, and this letter was not mailed, Bernice says that she will get me some stamps tomorrow. I want to tell you about two dishes. <laughs> Man, this is so hard to read. Cook some potatoes and mash them. Remember, something was given to Jill. Mix with cottage cheese and put in shape of a flower on a lettuce leaf with a spoonful of mayonnaise for the center. Then with three cups of boiled rice, make cream sauce out of one part milk, one heaping teaspoon of butter, and one heaping teaspoon of flour. I must get to bed now, so good night, mother. So this is to Betty. So we are going to make an assumption here that the woman whose cookbook this was, her name was Betty, and it's funny, this just makes me feel kind of emotional. I don't know why. It's so crazy and cool. That is so cool. So what we're going to do now is make Betty's apple sauce cake. So we need a teaspoon of baking soda. And one thing I've noticed in all of these recipes is that they don't call baking soda baking soda, it's just soda. Butter, lard, or Crisco, and almost all the recipes in most of these cookbooks call for Crisco. And I actually even remember that from when I was a kid where Crisco was like a main ingredient that was used all the time. So if you put it like this and tuck that underneath there and then lift up. Yeah, look at that, perfect. Perfect job. Okay, now we need to get a measuring cup. You wanna do... Whoa! 
<laughs> That's okay. No. Okay, next we need one teaspoon of baking soda. Yeah, definitely. There, that's good. Okay, two of those. There you go, that's okay. Okay, and, uh, put the lid back on for me. And then we need two cups of flour. Two cups in there. This says allspice, but it doesn't tell us how much. So let's put in half a, whoops, half a teaspoon. Go ahead. Well, that is kind of a spice. And then one teaspoon of vanilla. There you go. There we go. So now we're going to need to butter our cake pan here. You're gonna roll your sleeves up and get your hands in there and mush that around. Nice work. If you use your fingers like this, smear it up the side. You wanna to try to get the whole thing really well covered. Now I'm going to assume, although it doesn't say, that we're gonna bake it at 350. Let's just use this to scrape this off and then you can use that for licking the bowl, okay? So this recipe also called for currants, which I do not have. And because we already have so many raisins in our bread pudding, I decided not to substitute with anything and just make it a straight up applesauce cake. There we go. Betty's applesauce cake. So cool. Okay, I just put this cake outside so it could cool off quickly. So let's cut into it and give it a try. And see what it tastes like. As soon as I, <laughs> Dan's teasing me in the background. <clears throat> Let me try this again. As soon as I bit into this cake, it reminded me of my paternal grandmother and eating food at her house. So she must have made a cake very similar to this because the memories are so strong of what her house looked like. So I'm actually gonna call my mom and see if my grandma did make a, a, um, a, a cake like this, like an applesauce kind of cake. I'm always amazed by how strong memories are for me associated with the smell of food cooking or the flavor of food cooking. It was such a huge part of my childhood, so it makes sense, but it's good. I hope that you guys enjoyed today's video as much as I did. It was so much fun going through those cookbooks and I'm really looking forward to cooking more recipes out of them and using some more antique bakeware as we get it. I look forward to seeing you next time, everyone. Bye.